Well, good morning, dear colleagues, uh, dear audience. I'm happy to welcome you to the International Financial Congress uh, in our session for the macroprudential policies of the Bank of Russia, new challenges and tools. Uh, last year uh, was the year of a difficult economic crisis, the most difficult one and challenging since the times of the Great Depression. However, the financial sector was resilient and did not require any support, but was also able to support the real sector. Uh, through restructuring and through the uh, sustainable growth of lending. Why was that possible? Uh, that was possible due to the reforms after the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. And during those reforms, we changed the system of regulation. We introduced Basel III, and many of the regulators were also pursuing a macroprudential policy. The Bank of Russia, in previous years, was very active in pursuing its macroprudential policy. In particular, limiting the retail lending risks and the FX lending uh, to the companies. In 2019, the regulation of uh, the Bank of Russia was uh, added to uh, the uh, uh, debt uh, burden indicator. And the Bank of Russia also uh, put up a premium, a macroprudential premium, on uh, new unsupported and uncollateralized uh, loans. And uh, due to that, we uh, have accumulated uh, enough buffers in the banking system. During the pandemic, uh, the Bank of Russia was able to release uh, 400 uh, billion rubles in buffers, uh, that which was essential to many banks. And uh, some of the banks that were focusing on retail lending, uh, the effect was up to three percentage points. However, the buffers were uh, uh, used uh, not only for uncollateralized un lending and uh, mortgages, but for other loans as well, for example, uh, for SME loans. Now we see a pickup in the economy, quite a sustainable one, and the growth uh, accelerated growth in lending. Uh, uh, the uh, share of the uncollateralized loans is coming to 20 percent, uh, but uh, uh, the share of the uh, disburden loans uh, is already above the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the Bank of Russia, thanks to that, uh, is coming back uh, to the level of the premiums uh, put up uh, before the pandemic uh, for the consumer loans, uh, which are uncollateralized, and for mortgages. Uh, the debt burden of the uh, households is still growing, as we can see, and it is important, as we would think, uh, to really support uh, banks uh, with buffers and capital, uh, but it is also important uh, to have a direct uh, impact on the debt burden of the households, because there we can see risks uh, of not only some negative uh, shocks to the banks, uh, but there are also risks uh, to the households themselves. Uh, in the case of a long-term uh, uh, debt burden. And there might be also a risk uh, for the economy as a whole if the uh, bubbles would burst and uh, would uh, uh, also collapse the uh, demand. We do see that uh, buffer accumulation was a good instrument, uh, but they're still risky in terms of uh, bubble formation and uh, risks. And uh, uh, the banks that have uh, good capital can still pursue their risky lending simply allocating uh, more capital to such a uh, risky business. And hence, uh, the Bank of Russia is in favor of uh, broadening the toolkit, uh, um, tool set of macroprudential policies to add an instrument which is uh, actively used uh, uh, the tool that is used in the West, like a macroprudential limit or uh, quantitative uh, limit, it is not that we are going to limit uh, the growth rates. Uh, there is something else that we have in mind. We need to limit the uh, share of risky uh, credits in uh, loans and new lending. For example, we see some uh, risks uh, uh, for loans uh, with uh, over 80 percent debt burden, and uh, there the limits may be, say, 20 percent of the uh, new loans uh, for such uh, loans. Now, that uh, uh, draft law, and uh, this is also a part of the mandate of the Central Bank, was introduced uh, into the Parliament, and we're discussing that uh, with the ministries and the markets. Uh, and here in this session, we're going to discuss the challenges of macroprudential policy in Russia, and we're going to discuss uh, which of the in instruments and tools we can use uh, in response to such uh, challenges. And these are the things that we're going to discuss uh, with our speakers today. 
Uh, here together with me, we have uh, Nikolai Zhurovlev, Deputy Speaker of the Federation Council, uh, in this studio today, on the screen today, we have uh, Alexander Vedyakhin, first deputy chairman of uh, Sberbank of Russia. Good morning. Also online with us is John Fell, uh, uh, deputy director general for macroprudential policy and financial stability of uh, ECB. And uh, also with us uh, is uh, Stanislav Bolesniuk, uh, chairman of the board of directors of Tinkov Bank. And naturally, we do hope uh, that the audience is going to be very proactive in our discussions. And first of all, we would like to perhaps uh, ask uh, a question of principle about the goals of uh, macroprudential policy. Could you please uh, put up the uh, kind of like the pool uh, that we have now? What are the main goals of macroprudential policies? Accumulation of buffers, something that was very important to us during the pandemic. Uh, prevention of bubbles, uh, second option, which is also quite uh, relevant today, or maybe both. Uh, goals are very important uh, and uh, relevant. Uh, please vote, and uh, we would be interested in uh, having the results. Uh, but first, I would like to come to our speakers, and uh, perhaps they can share with us uh, uh, their responses and their answers and what they think about the macroprudential policy objectives uh, also uh, in the context of the pandemic. Maybe you can start with uh, Nikola Zhuralov here. And of course, uh, I uh, took the second, uh, oh, sorry, the third option that uh, both the buffer accumulation and, of course, uh, preventing bubbles, uh, these are the goals that uh, are all important. And macroprudential policy is a set of preventive measures and policies. Uh, first of all, against uh, any systemic risks uh, when some of the financial marketplace may to lose their resilience, and they would then come to the state, to the regulator uh, for assistance, uh, for some help. Uh, so, of course, both uh, goals are very important. And, uh, if the situation is quite calm in the market and uh, corporates and uh, financial marketplace uh, are making some uh, profit, uh, they are, of course, accumulating some buffers. But if there is a storm coming, or is already there, then if there are any negative impacts in the market, of course, those uh, buffers will have to be used. Uh, the task for the regulator is, of course, to prevent uh, the bubbles. Uh, however, not everything depends on the regulator, whether a bubble is going to happen. And uh, the regulator, in this particular case, the Central Bank of Russia, would also play a role when the government, for example, is providing some uh, concessional uh, loans uh, to particular sectors, like, for example, for mortgages. Uh, and, of course, uh, um, the uh, position of uh, several ministries and agencies and of the Central Bank would not coincide all the time. Uh, and of course, uh, trying to avoid uh, over-regulation is also of paramount importance. However, when we're talking about uh, accumulating buffers, we need to do that uh, in a very uh, cautious uh, way without uh, over-exaggerating. And, uh, and, of course, we want to avoid any excessive buffers because that would, of course, affect uh, the speed of our regulation and the ability of our banks to provide uh, lending to the economy. What can you say about the efficiency of uh, the uh, policy in the context of the pandemic? Then I would uh, say that, of course, the efficiency of your policy and your policy in general should be assessed not during the crisis but before the crisis, how the regulator is uh, preparing the market to any possible crises. And then I can uh, perhaps uh, 
rank the policy of the Central Bank as brilliant, uh, because this is the first uh, serious crisis when our financial institutions uh, did not really suffer from any uh, major institutional losses. Uh, they did not require any uh, recapitalization. They did not require any uh, salvation, and we didn't have to really uh, bail in or bail out any of the major plays in the market. And this is the, to the merits of the central bank and to the monetary authorities in general. And moreover, banks and uh, financial institutions uh, not only withstood the crisis, but they were also a key element in saving the other sectors of the economy. This was the main channel for support to the households uh, and to businesses. Uh, especially SMEs, and banks themselves provided uh, some support and restructuring uh, on their programs uh, that uh, sometimes were even more beneficial to the recipients and beneficiaries of uh, various uh, uh, support uh, uh, policies uh, and uh, loan holders. And I think that this is a very good, efficient uh, outcome of uh, the policy of uh, the Central Bank, uh, also focused on uh, removing any uh, players uh, from the market that are not uh, Holistic. And, of course, in terms of uh, various other support mechanisms uh, like the tax holidays and uh, subsidized mortgages and also employment support uh, mechanisms, uh, that, thanks to the Central Bank, uh, we did see some form of assistance uh, to the financial sector, which was also important uh, universally, and uh, the buffers were released and uh, uh, coupled with the uh, long-term uh, uh, inflation targeting policy uh, of uh, the Central Bank and uh, the setting of the policy rate uh, accordingly. Uh, that was also important to support the real sector and the industries of the economy in such challenging times. But the macro prudential policy, by the way, of course, looking forward, um, well, I mean, we are praising each other. Um, regulators and the legislators, but uh, that's it is quite uh, obvious. But we, we need to somehow avoid any uh, arbitrary decisions uh, in the market. So we want uh, uh, regulation uh, to be uh, the same for banks and for, for say, uh, fintech companies, uh, so that it would be quite clear to the microfinancial institutions, banks and creditors and uh, others. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, Law 115, uh, uh, the, uh, the approaches uh, to the calculation of the full value of uh, your loan, etc. Uh, this is something for us to really think about uh, for future. Thank you, Nikolai, for your very good assessment uh, of uh, our policy. Let's start with our banks. Let's start with Alexander. How did you answer the questions? Uh, Yes, Andrej, yes, Andrej, yes, 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 банки одновременно поддержать экономику это конечно и ипотечные кредиты и потребы то о чем тоже говорилось но знаете вот вопрос собственно говоря про проденциальную макропроденциальную политику я думаю что макропроденциальная политика же рождалась когда нам сложно было разделить риски на уровне каждого заемщика поэтому собственно говоря наверное следующий 
следующий шаг макро, макропровинциальной политики, он будет приближаться к провинциальной, и, может быть, наоборот. Ну, то есть, на мой взгляд, вот кризис заставляет нас искать новый уровень баланса между макроплодом и стандартным надзором провинциальной политики. И, Лиз, вы, наверное, зададите еще вопрос, собственно говоря, про действенность политики ЦБ и про предложения. Я вот как банк хотел бы вас немного покритиковать, пользуясь вот возможностью такой такой площадке, ну, собственно говоря, будет здорово, если регулятор еще раз посмотрит на регулирование по кредитованию экспортеров, потому что, ну, валюте, ну, собственно говоря, у них валютная выручка, мы здесь, на мой взгляд, дуем на воду, и в итоге эти экспортеры идут кредитоваться за рубеж, у банка в России скапливается сбыточная валютная ликвидность, ну, и так далее. То есть, типа, структурное воздействие именно на банки не очень хорошая, при том, что ну, по большому счету существенных рисков это не несет. Также хотелось бы еще раз вернуться к теме обоснованности ограничений по сделкам МНД. Сейчас мы после кризиса точно увидим, хотя мы его прошли в целом хорошо, но тем не менее кто-то не справился. Наверняка мы увидим с какой-то небольшой задержкой полгода максимум новые проблемы проблемные активы, которые будут выставляться на рынке, и, собственно говоря, обычная часть дает покупатель, другую часть как плечо дает банк, и, собственно говоря, это всегда было таким хорошим инструментом для того, чтобы перераспределять проблемные активы, сокращая заблоки за счет собственного участия. Ну, этот инструмент сейчас стал гораздо более дорогим. Ну и третья история, которую хотелось бы просветить, она очень новая. Она идет вроде как и не по теме макропродуциального регулирования, но на самом деле по факту является темой макропродуциального регулирования. Это регулирование экосистем. Но вот то, что мы увидели сейчас, это, конечно, существенное влияние на все банки без исключения. Это, вот, по крайней мере, те инструменты, которые которые лежат сейчас там, они существенным образом уменьшат достаточность капитала всех лидирующих российских банков. Больше того, предложенное регулирование является очень-очень процикличным. В негативном развитии цикла, ну, который точно произойдет когда-то, мы увидим только ухудшение ситуации для банков, то есть резкое и еще большее увеличение требований к достаточности капитала. Поэтому, собственно говоря, ну, Понятно, что до 1 на 9 есть у всех время это обсудить, но я вот пользуюсь этой площадкой тоже обращаю внимание и вас, как регулятор на это, и тоже знаю, что коллеги по цеху над этим работают, потому что тема очень-очень серьезная, особенно для тех, кто развивает эту систему, это будет существенный факт. Но это, повторюсь, это и макропроденциальная история, и история регулирования системы. Спасибо. Спасибо, Александр, за ваши идеи. Uh, it is actually within my competence, uh, this question of uh, lending to exporters, and we would be looking into that. Uh, but the only thing I can comment right now, uh, there's an important uh, uh, point about uh, going uh, through the crisis, uh, whether we had any problems with FX liquidity. Again, importantly, this time we had a very uh, easy situation compared even to other countries, like in Europe or in other parts of the world uh, where uh, they had uh, some challenges in their fax liquidity, we, unlike in previous times, uh, uh, managed uh, to really do well uh, with fax liquidity. Perhaps I can also support Alexander about his idea about uh, lending to exporters. It is very important. Uh, the companies uh, that uh, mostly have uh, fax revenues, it would be quite harmful to provide them with a ruble a lending, just like you know, providing individuals with FX loans who only have revenues and income in rubles. So I think it is an important issue to discuss. So maybe there we need to uh, really have some uh, easier requirements. So this is not something that we need to fight at. Perhaps I can also have some feedback from Stanislav. Uh, 
Ну, я тоже проголосовал за третий вариант, за Хоббитсы. Конечно, изначально мне нравится больше подход к возвращению пузырей, но в действительности нельзя все предусмотреть, все предугадать, и поэтому нужно использовать комбинированный подход и формировать буфер и капитал. Но также нужно понимать, что такая вещь нужно делать это очень аккуратно, потому что накопление буферов, тем более зачислить буфер, ведет к неэффективности бизнеса и в итоге ведет к торможению развития. Вот. Но здесь уже много говорили насчет э, действенности специальной политики Банка России, но в действительности кризис показал, что ну, те реформы, которые были сделаны, они привели к тому, что финансовая система э, пережила кризис достаточно легко и стабильно. Поэтому я хотел бы добавить э, относительно там, подходов, какие бывают еще подходы э, по там, накоплению буферов uh, и предотвращения. Я расскажу как бы это из нашей практики. Uh, у нас все решения принимаются uh, по детальному бизнес-плану. Ну, как все это делают. Но мы в нашей модели закладываем достаточно высокую ставку дисконтирования 30%. И что это дает? Это дает то, что мы доходы в будущем очень сильно дисконтируем. И, с одной стороны, как бы мы не стали про будущее, это будущее у нас будет дисконтировано. А с другой стороны, у нас по всем бизнес-линиям есть достаточно запас, который, ну, такой, это и свой буфер, и запас на какие-то там непредвиденные ситуации. На самом деле, у нас этот поход очень сильно выручал, там, в кризис прошло, мы их переживали. Uh, как бы хотел поделиться, что такой еще есть тоже альтернативный взгляд uh, через uh, доходность The capital adequacy requirements. Maybe now I'd like to ask John uh, for his opinion. We're not going to ask him about uh, Russia, but uh, in your opinion, uh, how efficient regulators in Europe uh, uh, in Europe were? Uh, did they pursue a macro prudential policy, and did this help uh, banks uh, to use the buffers to support the economy and to support their lending programs? And did you identify any? opportunities uh, to improve the macro potential policy in Europe. Uh, good morning, uh, Elisabeth. Um, so let me mention that um, just like the other speakers, um, I chose uh, the option of both, um, uh, that macro potential policy should aim at uh, building resilience and also contributing uh, to containing the buildup of vulnerabilities. There's not much more that I could add to what the speakers have all, the other speakers have already said. Um, I could maybe mention that, I mean, there, there are complementarities and, there are, and I think there are also trade-offs uh, between those two objectives. So, I mean, the, the complementarities in, <clears throat> we call it the, the belt and braces approach uh, to macroprudential policy. So, uh, you know, if you, if you can't contain um, or if you can't prevent uh, a bubble from building up and bursting, um, then you have uh, <clears throat> built up resilience uh, to ensure that this, the financial system can absorb the shock if that if that bubble were to burst. Uh, there are also trade-offs. Um, I mean, <clears throat> if if you're if if you're good at um, containing the building up of vulnerabilities, then in principle, um, it should mean that you don't need to have as much resilience um, as you would do if you were not very good um, at containing. Um, the buildup of, of vulnerabilities. And then maybe just one other point as well um, for us. I mean, we see very much an assignment um, of macro prudential policies uh, instruments depending on, on the objective. So, I mean, we, we think that capital-based measures uh, tend to be very good at um, achieving the, <clears throat> the, the resilience objective, whereas borrower-based measures, so controls on, on, on lending growth, seem to be better at, at, at avoiding the building up of vulnerabilities. Um, you asked how effective have, have um, um, through the pandemic in Europe. I mean, maybe I, I, I could mention that so I mean, going in, I mean, I think you mentioned it in your opening remarks, Elisabetta, that we had a very resilient um, <clears throat> bank. You, you had a very resilient banking system. So did we. Um, and that is thanks to um, <clears throat> all of the efforts um, of the, of, of the post-global financial crisis um, regulatory reform. Uh, <clears throat> but on the macroprudential policy side, only seven euro area countries had actually created counter-cyclical capital buffers before the pandemic. <clears throat> so only seven. Um, had activated uh, the counter-cyclical capital buffer. So on the eve of the pandemic, uh, the, 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 the counter-cyclical capital buffer actually only accounted for about 0.1% uh, 
um, are 10 basis points um, of risk-weighted assets for the euro area banking system as a whole. So there was really very limited room uh, to release market potential capital buffers. <clears throat> In nominal terms, um, just to put those figures into perspective, the, the releases of capital buffers after the COVID-19 outbreak accounted for about 20 billion euro. But um, the, on the micro potential side, um, the single supervisory mechanism, which has now become very important in the, in, in, in the supervision of banks in the euro area, took uh, significant um, action, um, including allowing banks to operate below uh, their pillar, pillar two guidance and front, front loading new roles on, on pillar two requirement uh, composition. All in all, that meant that around 120 billion uh, was available uh, for the entire banking system of capital. So the, the scale was about six times um, what we had on, on, on the, on the macroprudential side. But the, I think another important point is macroprudential policy, microprudential supervision, microprudential action was not operating in a vacuum. We had a, we had a number of other policy actions uh, that were being implemented at the same time, and they were very complementary. So I'm thinking of, for example, public loan guarantee programs and other fiscal measures um, that avoided uh, liquidity problems, particularly for, for, for non-financial firms um, and also households. And I mean, I think overall, all of those policies together were very effective in supporting the credit supply to the real economy and preventing um, widespread defaults. So we haven't really seen an increase in, in, in default rates um, are indeed non-performing loans in the non-financial sector. Um, you were asking as well about how active uh, European banks um, have capital buffer and other, and other buffers. Well, there has been this release, uh, but so far euro area banks have not really needed to make use of, of, of capital buffers. And I think it resonates with what um, you already said about the, about the Russian banking system. Um, that, uh, I mean, the, the, the system as a whole still remained, remained, remained profitable. Um, and the euro area aggregate core equity tier one ratio, it actually increased um, uh, since the end of, of, of 2019. So it's 0.7 percentage points, so up to around 15.5% core equity tier one now. And that, that's thanks to a number of factors, retained earnings, regulatory relief measures, uh, a rebalancing of, of um, portfolios um, with lower risk weights um, and of course what I mentioned already direct support to borrowers which kept insolvency low. So we estimate that all of the, the fiscal and the prudential measures combined supported core equity tier one ratios uh, for the banks um, for the banking system as a whole by around 150 basis points uh, during 2020. About changes um, so, I mean, I think one thing, I mean, and, and I think it, 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 it follows very much from what I've already said, um, going into this, uh, we didn't have a lot of releasable uh, capital um, in the system. So, I mean, I think one of the lessons, and if we are, if we're thinking about any changes in the future, we think a higher share of releasable uh, macroprudential capital buffers um, would be desirable. Um, if you have more releasable capital, capital in the system, then the ability of macroprudential policy authorities to react uh, counter-cyclical in the face of severe system-wide shocks uh, would be strengthened. And of course, that would be, I mean, the, 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 the CCYB was, was established very much around the whole concept of excessive credit growth. I mean, that wasn't uh, the diagnosis uh, coming from, from, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think we need to think more broadly about the nature of the shocks uh, that can hit the financial system as well. Um, and again, that would argue for having more, um, more releasable capital in the system. But that said, any changes to the framework would need to be coordinated, of course, within the euro area across all of the euro area countries, and it would need to be consistent with uh, general Basel III principles. Thank you very much, John. We also realized uh, the importance of having these capital buffers. And now I'd like uh, to go back to what we have at the moment. Could you please uh, show us these slides? And I'd like to ask the representatives of the banks uh, who are promoting consumer lending, what do you see in the market? 
кредитования. И вот у меня на слайде... What is the reason for a quick rebound? Here are some of the reasons for growth, the number of borrowers, uh, and so the run-ahead side, you can see the growth in general. So in terms of unsecured loans, the number of active borrowers declined, but the overall value, the envelope, is growing. It means that uh, the indebtedness at the level of each individual borrower is growing. So it means the PTI is growing. So maybe we'll start with Alexander. Is there any reason? To, is there any reason for concern? Знаете как? Start with Barbank, with Barbank. Well, you always have reason for concern. You just need to understand what's the probability of that. Смотрите, сама суть кредита это скорее материализация в будущее, а не в прошлое. Вот такое развитие на мой взгляд связано с несколькими вещами. Первое это то, что у людей начал появляться оптимизм и уверенность в будущем, потому что человек, который не уверен в будущем, не будет никогда уверен. Uh, there is some pent up demand. People were in lockdown in wave one and wave two, and they didn't spend that much. And they didn't buy new cars, they didn't buy new smartphones or any other consumer electronics. That's why we see a lot of new consumer loans. But we don't see a bubble here. We believe that the situation is absolutely under control. And you can see that across all our buckets, the early ones and the later ones, uh, the supplies to spare, and according to open source data, it all supplies to the market in general. And Stanislav and their bank has everything under control and other colleagues report the same. So we don't even see any early signs of a worsening. And that makes us happy. Our mortgage. That's a big, big, big item on the agenda, but uh, overall, mortgage will continue in the next 10 to 15 years. So it will be a major driver for the economy and our GDP and uh, huge driver for banking business. Mortgage accounts for 9% of GDP at the moment. And in developed nations, it's more than 50%. Even if you, if we aim at 25%, that could help us to buttress the economy for the next 15 years, and that will be still healthy growth. Again, on mortgage, we always believe that this is the uh, middle, middle plus class, but 1.5 uh, million ruble loan that is uh, affordable and that could help people to buy a one-bedroom apartment uh, somewhere in the uh, Russian region, in a district center or in a regional center. That would require a monthly payment of 12,000 rubles. Well, 12,000 rubles is quite an affordable amount. You can earn that and pay that. The default on the mortgage, again, it's not a disaster, not for an individual, either for a fund individual or for the bank, because the banks are always happy to restructure, to help out their customers. So it's fine there. And traditionally, the regulator has always been concerned about loans with LTV 80 plus, with a small initial installment, but our share in our portfolio is down 1.5 percent versus 2019. So it means that people have more money. Очень важно по ипотеке тоже средний срок восемнадцать лет. The average maturity is 18 years, 1.8, but the real maturity is 4.5 years. Just imagine, 4.5 years, and that's a surprising phenomenon. But it's really simple. People first buy a, a 
first buy a department and then they sell the previous apartment they have and they pay it off. So it could be a high LTV, but they know that they would sell their previous apartment and that would cover that. So, and that's done by the, uh, the between 30 to 50 percent of the market. This is why we are pretty optimistic uh, on uh, consumer lending and mortgages. What about Stanislav? I agree with Alexander that risks are under control. No major negative changes could be observed. Why are we seeing this active growth? There are several reasons to it. First, in this COVID era, the entire financial system, the regulators, the government and the banks, have really performed in a stellar way. It was a smooth operation, and we managed to avoid any major losses uh, on the borrower side and on the bank side. So it was really nothing to worry about. And uh, it, really, it was really amazing to see that we managed to avoid huge volatility and we had the right buffers uh, that could be releasable buffers that could have helped us uh, to overcome it. The second reason is uh, lower rates. Household expectations for inflation are still very high. Some people still believe it's best to buy an apartment today. And you can see that uh, with cars or with consumer electronics, when there's always movement in prices, and as Alexander said, there you have pent up demand. People couldn't buy something a year ago, and people expect that the price would go up because it's linked to the uh, uh, US dollars, for example, or to a fix. Uh, in the case of cars. So it's easier for them to take out a loan right now and buy today and not tomorrow when the price will be higher. And the third factor is one of the major ones. Current regulation forces the banks and the clients to issue longer-term loans, and longer-term loans, one way or another, increase the, the value, the total value of the customer. So if these are, if we talk about unsecured loans, we need to split the to, to focus and differentiate maturity, and if it's secured, if it's mortgage, definitely many mortgage loans should be long-term, and you need to look at LTV and other factors. LTV 80 plus is going down, as Alexander said. That's a good sign for the market, too. Thank you. That's fine. That's clear. And I'd like to ask Nikolai. So are you seeing any risks for a higher debt burden? in the households. Just like uh, our colleagues, I don't see any disaster, any tragedy in the level of indebtedness at the moment. Mortgage has made a certain contribution into the level of indebtedness. Nevertheless, currently, the situation is absolutely not critical. In the past 18 months, the Russian president announced a series of initiatives to support uh, households for families with uh, multiple children, for other categories, for other vulnerable groups. There have been many family benefits that were issued, and these benefits have helped to balance out uh, family household budgets and the PTI ratio. Also, the regulator and the lawmakers have made a lot to keep it under control, to cool it down, to cool down the consumer market since 2013. The central bank have taken a number of measures. And so the PTI ratio has been a good addition. The lawmakers have introduced laws to toughen measures in terms of uh, 
LTV, we introduced a law on microfinancial organizations, uh, on uh, the uh, minimum wage, minimum subsistence level that cannot be lowered. Definitely we need to provide assistance to vulnerable groups, to categories with a high level of indebtedness. And this is kind of a, a tax on the economy that would force good taxpayers to pay for the bad taxpayers. So the stakes are higher, definitely, if, you, if we are seeing a high level of indebtedness. As for this concessional mortgage program, in 2020, that was a huge driver for this particular market and for other adjacent industries, construction and development. That was a huge benefit. And uh, you know what we think about uh, the extension of the concessional mortgage program. We believe that it has to be more targeted. It has to be differentiated uh, between the regions, uh, depending on uh, salaries. So we are on the same page with the central bank. So we will try to recalibrate it going forward. So where do we see the danger? The first danger that we see is that the low initial installment so as you as the regulator need to focus heavily on that to make sure that first installments would not be funded from other loans. You need to try to identify that, to calculate everything in advance. Second, there are new products. It's a mortgage for furniture and renovation. We don't regulate that, but that also increases the level of indebtedness. Banks have to compete, so banks have to issue more loans, but I don't think it's going to be a happy ending. You need to calculate that, you need to differentiate those payments. Why do you do borrowers take out mortgages just to buy new walls, new apartments, or for adjacent uh, costs? Well, we try to use the market data, including from the Bureau of Credit History. What about the new bill to provide uh, extra mandate uh, for uh, macroprudential limits? Uh, that could be issued to the central bank. What do you think about this new bill? And positive in this new bill on the direct uh, quantitative limits. Why? I believe we need to restrict, to, to introduce caps on uh, maximum debt for households. You need to have this tool just like many other regulators uh, in other developed nations. And I think we've agreed on consumer loans and mortgage, and we need to take it a step further. We need to expand that mandate. Just a couple of examples. Loans to Russian regions. If you ask me a couple of years ago, is it a good bank that only issues loans to Russian regions? Well, that could be a great bank. But if we replace commercial loans with budget loans, and these banks would have most of these loans prepaid, their business model would incur certain risks. So we need to be careful about such examples. We need to be able to calculate, identify, diagnose such risks, and you have to have the mandate to put restrictions on such activities. So we have John Fell with us. Um, what about other countries? How widespread uh, such measures are widespread in other countries? I mean, macroprudential limits. Can countries use both, use both capital-based measures and macroprudential restrictions? How do this, the, does this mix work? Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, as I was saying earlier, um, when we think that capital-based measures are, are more effective in, in um, in securing resilience of the banking system and um, that the borrower based measures are are more useful in um, in containing in containing excessive credit growth. Uh, so in many euro area countries, uh, robust house price and, and, and mortgage uh, growth um, can continued uh, throughout the throughout the pandemic. Um, 
And many euro area countries have implemented borrower based tools uh, for, for, for real estate um, in recent years. And I should mention, I mean, and, and coming to, to your question, um, some of them have also made use of capital based measures as well at the same time. There, there are a couple of countries that have done that where they have um, activated the counter cyclical capital buffer, for example, and also um, used borrower based measures and indeed also some, some risk weight measures and so on as well. Uh, specifically aimed at <clears throat> uh, containing um, exuberance in the housing markets. Uh, I mean, right now um, in, in, in the euro area, um, as, as I said, m many countries um, are, are seeing um, robust house price growth, and mortgage loan growth has continued. Um, and this was um, especially the case um, in, in countries that had pre-existing um, residential real estate vulnerabilities. Um, the European Systemic Risk Board um, issued warnings um, for, for, for several euro area countries a couple of years ago. Um, and so you can you can find the countries there. Um, but the, the, the divergence uh, between uh, the, the residential real, real estate and economic cycles, uh, I mean, I guess we're kind of you know, I mean, there is a kind of an interplay between what's happening on in residential real estate markets and what's happening in the real economy. Um, and so what you don't want is to take is to activate macro potential policy measures um, aimed at containing uh, the building up of vulnerabilities in the, in the housing market, but possibly threatening or jeopardizing um, the, the, the economic recovery um, that is going on and is and, and is still fragile. Um, so um, the, the, the divergence uh, between cycles continues to imply downside risks in adverse growth scenarios, especially if, for example, and I was mentioning it earlier as well, the government support measures, um, if they were scaled back too early, um, there is a risk um, that this could cause a problem, could, 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 cause, a, could, could cause a setback uh, to, to the real economy. So we're, we're basically recommending that a gradual adjustment of borrower-based measures could be appropriate um, in countries. So but by that, I mean loan to value, uh, loan to income and so on, those kinds of measures, that they could be appropriate in countries where vulnerabilities related to loose lending standards and are indeed excessive um, household debt continue to build up. Um, <clears throat> and we are, we are monitoring uh, very carefully Спасибо большое, Джон. Действительно, мы тоже считаем, что оба... Thank you very much, John. We both believe, uh, we also believe that uh, a mix, uh, a proper mix uh, would be appropriate. And, uh, you know, if we apply too heavy capital-based measures, then uh, some of the activities could uh, shift into microfinancial organizations. So we have to be careful about it. Could you please put up the vote results on the screen? We didn't have too much time to ask the bands what they think about our additional measures, but we'll definitely continue dialogue. And we are in direct contact with the bank in terms of additional measures, and we'll be able to discuss that offline. Please bring up the results of the vote on the screen. So most of uh, the audience voted uh, for the third option. It is important for us, and what the pandemic demonstrated is that it is important to have resilient, strong banks that could support the economy. As everyone said, having releasable buffers is extremely important uh, in supporting lending and uh, real economy. But at the same time, all of the panelists and the audience believe that we need to be able to avoid bubbles and excessive exorbitant uh, debt burden. It's also a major goal for macro prudential policy, a major goal for the Russian Central Bank, and we'll continue working on that. And in this regard, we believe that a bill to provide extra mandate to the central bank is important and we need to push it through the parliament so that going forward we can constrain the risks related to the most riskier to the riskiest loans particularly given the fact that we're seeing higher share of loans in gdp 
and mortgage so far definitely has been a very good quality, minimum number of uh, areas, but provided that we have structural changes, we need to keep uh, the risks are on our radar, and this discussion has proven that it's important to discuss both goals. Our session is uh, coming to an end. I'd like to thank both the panelists and the audience for this insightful debate. We've uh, seen new, fresh ideas from all of the participants, and uh, definitely we 